I'm crying. I begin meeting with some of the people from the national office about missions. And every time I have those conversations, there's just this joy that's welling up within me. And then on the very last day of the conference, uh, they have this morning portion of it. And so uh, we're about to end, and I meet this couple that I know are missionaries to Guinea, where we've applied. And so I, I run up to them, and I'm like, hey, I'm so-and-so, and my wife and I have applied at this youth center in Guinea. Do you know anything about the youth center? Do you know who works there? Could you tell me anything about it? And they're like, oh, you mean the youth center that we run? And I was like, I guess so, yeah. And, and so I said, well, wow, that's really cool. Do you have any time to talk? And they're like, well, we're about to get on a plane to go back to Guinea, but we have half an hour he said, great, let's grab coffee. And so we sit down, we have this chance encounter, you know, chance encounter. We sit down and they begin describing the ministry and they begin telling us about what they value and what they want to see happen in their vision. And all of it's resonating with me. And they begin asking me questions and I'm describing who we are and what we value. And there's just synergy. Even down to like, I mean, it was weird, like hobbies, like we have the same hobbies. Like it was very strange. It was really, really cool. And so we finished that conversation and I was like super pumped. <laughs> I'm like, wow, this really feels like this is what God's up to. And so I told Lashana all about it and she's getting excited. And uh, for, for us, one of the things that we really wanted, that we really desired, this was actually one of our fleeces that we said, God, we, we need this to be true if this is something you're calling us into, is we needed to be somewhere where we knew we'd have community, where we knew we wouldn't be alone, that there'd be other people on team with us. And this was just such a clear answer to that prayer. God saying, yes, you will have other people with you. So that was a really cool affirmation. I fly back to Lincoln. About a month later, we then fly out to Colorado Springs for our second interview at the national office. And again, there was a weird chance encounter. We, we get on the ground, and uh, they drive us to the hotel. And we, we go to check in, and the guy at the hotel is like, yeah, your room's not going to be ready for a few hours. And we're like, uh, it's check-in time. And he's like, yeah, it's not ready. <laughs> like, okay. And so we go back to the national office, and we're just sitting in this office, like twiddling our thumbs exhausted, stressed out about the next day, wanting to be in our hotel. And uh, someone comes and they begin talking to us and, and they tell us that there's this other couple called the Andersons, that's their name, and that they're a year ahead of us in the process, that they've actually been accepted to be missionaries to Guinea working at the youth center, and that they are in Colorado Springs at that moment training and preparing. And they're like, wouldn't it be cool if you could meet them? And we were like, yeah, that'd be great. And they're like, yeah, it won't happen. <laughs> like they're in missionary training. It's very strenuous. It's very structured. They never have the afternoon off. But we'll text them anyways, just in case. And uh, it happened to be that their instructor for that day had some emergency pop up and he canceled class for the afternoon. So because we couldn't get into our hotel room and because they happened to have class free, we ended up hiking through the mountains for an hour with this couple that we theoretically would be working with. And we just had this great connection and this friendship just blossomed over the course of this hour. They were a young couple with young kids. And once again, it felt like such an affirmation of God saying, you're not going to be alone. I have people I'm preparing to work with you, continue to move forward. So we do our second level interview. They green light us to move forward. It was a great interview. They said, yes, we think that you're called to this. You should keep going. So we come back to Lincoln. We continue praying, God, is this what you have for us? Continue to take the next step. We reach our third level interview, which is with the Guinea team in Africa. And we talk to them. And uh, at, at this point for Lashana and I, we're like, okay, we, we, there's no more goofing around. Like, we got to know if this is for sure what God has. And so we just begin asking very specific questions. Like, this is something that we really value. We need this to be true in a position that we're going to go to. Do you value this? And to a T, they said, yes. That's one of the most critical aspects of our ministry. Across the board, whenever we'd say, man, is this true of this position? They said, yes, we long for that. And to a T, when they would describe the ministry, everything that they talked about were the sort of things that we value, that we desire. And so we got off that call, and we're on cloud nine. We're super excited. We're feeling like, yeah, this is what God's up to. Over and over again, as we set out, man, God, you need to affirm this. Uh, I need you to show us this. He did over and over again. And so I emailed them the next day, and I said, hey, we were like super jazzed from this uh, time that we had together. Um, we feel very confident, like God's asking us to do this. Do you feel confident of that? And I specifically said, would we be an answer of prayer for you? Because wherever we went, we wanted it to be a place where we're not just going and working with other people. We're, we're actually going to be a deliverance, an answer of prayer for those people. And so 
They emailed us back and they said, yes, we've unanimously decided that we want you guys to join us, so we're inviting you to come. And uh, we've been praying that God would send us a relational disciple maker and a teacher. (laughs) And for Lashana and I, that's kind of how we would describe ourselves. Uh, They've been praying for those specific things, and and that's exactly how God's wired us. And so uh, we entered into this waiting period, and, and then, like I said, about a month ago, we found out that the board had met, they had looked over our application, And they had decided prayerfully that, yes, God was calling us into this. And so that's kind of the really short, really condensed version of our story about how God saw a need in the Guinean people and his heart broke for them. And he developed this redemptive plan of salvation for them. And then he grabbed two ordinary people and he said, I want you to join me in what I'm up to. I want you to be on mission with me. And so Lashawn and I are currently preparing for that. We're getting everything ready. Like I said, at the end of August, we're going to go to France for a year, study French, hopefully become somewhat fluent in it before transitioning down to Guinea, where we'll be serving for the next few years at least. And so I read for you the Great Commission. Those words, to go into all the world, now 2,000 years later, are beginning to become very real for us. God's call and commission has been put upon us. We feel very confident that he said, this is where I want you. This is what it looks like for you to live this out. And so we're moving forward in faith and in trust, and we are totally expectant of God doing the miraculous. And we're anticipating experiencing the divine. And we expect that God's going to do something really cool in us and through us, that he's going to empower us and enable us. We expect all of that. But there's more to our story than that. Because alongside all of the expectancy and the anticipation, we also are currently experiencing a lot of fear and a lot of hesitancy and a lot of dread. There's a lot within us that feels extremely excited, and and yet there's parts of us that are going, this is a really bad idea. (laughs) You're about to move across the country to a people you don't know, to speak a language you don't know, in a cultural context you don't understand. Why in the world are you doing that? And so we have to be honest about these fears that we feel that really tug at us that, to be honest with you, throughout the last year have just been plaguing us. And even now, when we feel so confident God has said go, we still have these fears and these insecurities and these doubts bubbling up within us. And man, as we wrestle with them and as we question what do we do with this, part of us can't help but wonder, did God really say go? Everything I told you about our story is true, and yet there's so much within us that makes us want to pause and say, man, maybe maybe this isn't what God has. Maybe he doesn't want us to go because we're terrified of this. I don't know that we can do this. I don't know that we have what it takes for this. Can we really move across the world and and do this kind of work? I'm not sure that we have what it takes. And so when we have these hesitancies and this fear, there's a tendency within me to, to want to pause and say, hang on, maybe this isn't right. And even though God has called us to join him, just as he called the disciples, just as he called Moses, just as he called Joshua and so many others, man, I don't really feel like God has called us like those men because I look at their lives and what they did and I think, man, that can't be me. I can't do that. We don't have what it takes. And so we're stuck in this place where we're wrestling. And I told you our story and every bit of what I said was true, but there's another side of the story that I didn't share with you. And that's the part that hasn't been all fun, that hasn't been joyous, that hasn't been celebratory. That's the part that's been actually a very real struggle for us. I told you about how we uh, originally intended to go out with Envision to Burkina Faso, but I didn't tell you about how when we found out that God had closed that door, we were really directionless and we felt really hopeless. And a big part of us wondered, man, did we screw up along the way? (laughs) Did we do something wrong? Why won't God let us go? And we had to sit in that I told you about how we ended up in Lincoln at Middle Cross and how that was a really good season of life, and it really was, but I didn't tell you about how difficult it was for me. I felt like I was stuck in Lincoln. I didn't get to be in Lincoln. I was stuck there. It's the last place I wanted to be. (laughs) I didn't tell you about how I had to work bivocationally for the first year and then support raise to stay on staff and how, man, part of me just felt like a failure because of that. I didn't tell you about how when the uh, trip to Mali got canceled, Lashana and I kind of felt like God had dangled this carrot in front of us and then yanked it away, and we were left feeling like, man, maybe we're just never going to go. 
I didn't tell you about how difficult it was to talk to our parents and tell them this is something that we're thinking and planning and, and to agonize over how do you even deliver that sort of news, especially for Lashana's parents who aren't believers. How do I look my father-in-law in the eye and say, hey, I'm taking your daughter and your granddaughter and you're not going to see them for four years. I told you about how uh, we did all these interviews and how they went so well. I didn't tell you about the incredible fear we had going into them and wondering, man, are, are we adequate enough? Do we have what it takes? Can we do this? I told you about going to council and that great experience and uh, the orchestration of meeting this couple, the Claysons, and how excited it was. I didn't tell you how hard it was that Lashana wasn't with me during that journey and how I had to just tell her about it over the phone. I told you about how we wrestled and we questioned together as I, as I got this restlessness within me that we were supposed to do something else. I didn't tell you about how Lashana was in a very different place than me and how for months we had very difficult conversations where I was saying, I think we're supposed to do this, and Lashana was saying, I think we're supposed to do this. And how sometimes those conversations ended before they were even concluded because it became too difficult to continue the conversation. So months of this, months of praying, having no clue what God was doing, I told you about how often God said, take the next step, take the next step. I didn't tell you how hard it was to not know where any of that was leading. <laughs> to look into the unknown and say, yeah, we don't know what's going to come from this. And how often we kind of wanted to pull the parachute and say, we're done. <laughs> we're backing out. This is too scary. This is too unknown. I didn't tell you about all of the fears and the insecurities we have the fears around, man, can we even learn another language? Can we become fluent in another language? The fear of, are we adaptable enough? Can we adapt to a completely different culture, a completely different place? I didn't tell you about the fear and the insecurity of, man, are, when we get there, are we going to be able to actually contribute to this team? Do we have anything of value to bring? Or are we just going to go there and be warm bodies? These are all the things that we've been wrestling with over the last year. And while it's been great and we believe God has done the divine and the miraculous to bring us to this place and we believe 100% that his call is there all of this is still true we have these fears and these insecurities and the reason i share this is i think we have a tendency when god says go to say but wait a second what about all of this i am not sure about this and we end up i think often disqualifying ourselves from ministry because of our fears because of our insecurities and because of our doubts and this morning, it would be dishonest if I came up here and I just told you that first exciting half of the story and said, this is our lives, and then leave. And maybe you leave and you think, man, that's, that's pretty cool. God's called them, they're going. But that's not what God's done in me. At least that's how I often feel when I hear people share their stories. I think, wow, that's so cool. It's just, it seems so obvious. And I got to tell you, for us, it has not been obvious. It is not been easy. It's been a very difficult journey of wrestling with each other, wrestling with the Lord and saying, is this really what you have? I'm not too sure. But that also is a part of the biblical pattern of God's calling. God sees people in need. His heart breaks. He forms a plan of redemption and salvation. He invites others to join him in that. And then there's a fourth piece, which is the people he calls often are incredibly doubtful, incredibly fearful, and incredibly insecure just like you and I. I read for you the Great Commission as we started this morning, but I didn't read for you the verse preceding the Great Commission. That's the other side of the story. It says, When they saw him, him being Jesus, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. This is Jesus speaking to his 11 disciples, the guy who knows him better than anyone else. These are the guys who are going to go forth and they're going to plant the church, they're going to establish it, they're going to expand it, they're going to begin this thing we call Christianity. And some of them are worshiping their risen Savior doubtful. They don't know what to do with this. We don't know exactly what they doubted. Maybe they doubted that it was really Jesus. Maybe they doubted that they had what it took for the mission he was about to lay out. Maybe they doubted the future and they weren't sure what was going to happen. We don't know, but these guys were doubtful. They weren't sure. And yet these are still the guys that God said, go. These are still the men to whom Jesus said, I want you to carry on what I started despite their doubting. I read for you Moses' calling and his commission into ministry, his job, his role of joining God and bringing salvation to the Israelite people. I didn't read for you Moses' response. Directly after God lays out the plan and he says, I'm going to do this, I'm going to send you. Here's what Moses says in, in verse 11 of chapter 3. He says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh 
and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt. Here's Moses racked with insecurity. Who am I to do this? I don't have what it takes. And God assures him, he says, no, no, I'm going to be with you, Moses. It's going to be okay. To which Moses responds in confidence and faith, no. <laughs> Verse 13, he says, uh, I'm going to go to the sons of Israel and I'm going to say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? In other words, I'm going to go to these guys and I'm going to say, God sent me. And they're going to say, who's God? And I'm, I don't know. I don't know you well enough, Lord. I don't know this faith thing well enough. I don't know what I'm going to say. Moses' mind, after the living God of the universe speaking to him from the burning bush, after he says, I want you to go, Moses, Moses, his mind goes to what if scenarios. What if this happens? What if that happens? I don't know what I'm going to do. The rest of the chapter is God outlining in specific detail the plan and everything that he's going to do. And he says, Moses, it's going to be okay. To which Moses responds, what if they won't believe me or listen to what I say? For they may say the Lord's not appeared to you. <laughs> God says, here's the whole plan, Moses. It's going to be good. He promises him one day you're going to be back on this very mountain. You're going to be worshiping with all the Israelites. And Moses says, yeah, but they might not believe me. They might not believe that you sent me to which God shows him miracles. And he says, you're going to perform these miracles and they're going to believe you. To which Moses says, Please, Lord, I've never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. In other words, I don't speak too well, Lord. I'm not the guy to go and lead these people. I don't know how to do this. I'm not talented. I'm not gifted enough. To which Moses, or God says to Moses, Don't you know who made man's mouth? Don't you think I can give you what you need to speak? To which Moses, at the very end of this whole long conversation, says, Please, Lord, now send the message by whoever you will. In other words, send someone else. Anyone but me, God. I don't know that I can do this. Moses, the man who went on to bring plagues onto Egypt, to part the Red Sea, cross on dry land, who received the Ten Commandments, who led the people in the Exodus, who established the Israelite nation, that guy at this moment in time was an ordinary shepherd. He was just a middle-aged guy. He was married. He had some kids, and he had some sheep he took care of. And when God said, I'm sending you for this incredible, this divine purpose and meaning, Moses said, I don't have what it takes. I'm the wrong guy for the job. Racked with insecurity, and his insecurity almost kept him from moving forward and experiencing what God had for him. Lastly, I read for you the story of uh, Joshua's commission, how God said, we're not done yet, Joshua. Moses is dead, but I want you to continue on. Here's what God then tells Joshua after that starting in verse 6. He says, Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right nor to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success." Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Why would God say to this young guy, Joshua, do not tremble, do not be dismayed? Why would he say three times over, be strong and courageous, unless Joshua is sitting there shaking in his boots? Joshua is terrified of this job God has just laid on his shoulders, and God says over and over again, Joshua, be strong and courageous. Do not fear. Do not be dismayed. I'm going to be with you. It's going to be all right. These aren't just a few isolated cases. Over and over again in Scripture, the people that God calls out to be on mission are those who are fearful and insecure and doubtful. And I don't know about you, but that's definitely who we are. That's where we're at. God's call to them is the same as his call to us. Be strong and courageous. You look in the prophets, you have guys like Jeremiah and Jonah and Habakkuk, guys who really wrestled with God, what God asked them to do and said, man, I don't know that this is right, God. That doesn't seem accurate. That doesn't seem like the right thing to do. And over and over again, God assured and, and said, just be faithful, just be obedient. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm about. And so at, at a certain point, you and I need to move beyond the fears and the insecurities and the doubts we have. And we need to look at the call that we know for sure God has given us to go into all the world. And we need to say, what are we going to do with this? At a certain point, we need to stop allowing fear, insecurity, and doubt to rob us of what we're meant for. And instead, we need to genuinely look at it and say, man, what do I do with this? And what are the implications 
of this call that God has placed on my life. We have this remarkable tendency to disqualify ourselves from ministry and from God's call because we conclude we don't have what it takes. We're not smart enough. We're not talented enough. Uh, we can't do that sort of thing. God would surely, there's got to be someone better than us for the job. He, I'm too messed up. I can't do this. And so God might be saying to you very clearly, go. But, but these fears and these insecurities, they choke out the life of God's call in our heart. And what we're left with is settling for complacency and status quo, living just an average normal life when God has called each and every one of us to divine purpose and meaning. And if we want to take this book seriously, if, if we want to say, yeah, we believe what this says, then we have to say, if God is who he says he is, and we are who he says we are, and he will do what he has promised he will do, then why do our lives reflect so much fear why are the choices we make so often motivated not out of faith, not out of trust, not out of promise, but out of fear and insecurity? And so this morning I share all this with you because I don't want to leave this morning and, I, and you to feel like, man, God's called them. I want you to leave this morning and say, God has called us. And there's nothing remarkable about Lashana and I. He's just given us a specific call and we've come to conclude that this is what he desires out of wrestling, out of struggling, out of hardship, out of pressing into fear and being honest with it and saying, man, this is where I'm at, telling each other that, telling those around us that, going to the Lord with that and saying, God, this is where I am. I don't know what to do with this, but I want to be obedient to you. At a certain point, you have to make that decision and say, oh, what am I going to do with the call to do the thing that is so scary to me and the incredible fear and insecurity I have that feels much more safe for me. So the question that uh, I want you to wrestle with this morning is how has fear robbed you of what you're intended for? God intends to do the miraculous and the divine both in our lives and through our lives to those around us. God has incredible intention in store for those of us who will choose to trust him and impress into him. That's what we're meant for. How has fear robbed you of that? How has fear taken what God intends to do in you and through you and caused you to sacrifice it for the sake of something that feels more safe? And one way to process through that question is, how different would your life be and what would be different about your life if you didn't have the fears you have? If the fear in your heart, the things you dread, wasn't present, what would be different about your life? And, and whatever comes up for you when you think through that, when you process that, it's probably what God's calling you into. Because the enemy of our souls wants nothing more than for you and I to live in fear and trepidation. He wants nothing more than for us to be scared and to shrink back. And so he instills in our hearts all sorts of lies and insecurities straight from the pit of hell that keep us shackled and bound down, that keep us from running alongside the Lord and the incredible mission that he's on of redeeming the world. That's what you and I are meant for. And so we have to be honest about what we're facing. And so we choose strength, we choose courage, and that doesn't look like pretending like we're not afraid. That doesn't look like taking all our fears and shoving them into a closet and closing the door and saying, yeah, we're good. Strength and courage is looking your fear in the eye and saying, but God, but God is here. God has called me. God is with me. God's promise over and over again to those he calls is, I am with you. He says to the disciples, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He tells Moses, I'm going to be with you, Moses. He tells Joshua, just as I was with Moses, I'm going to